going on everybody how the heck are you doing it is jason from the yahoo and the tour channel and i am reading a writing by mr todd bennett from shema yisrael.net and he has a youtube channel which is also shema yisrael and he has fantastic writings and this brother understands these times and dates and things I think better than anyone I've ever met. He actually has answers to it. And usually when I ask people questions, I'm left in wonderment. I don't understand. But Brother Todd is always on top of this stuff. And I'm thankful for him. And I'm thankful for his ministry and for him being such a good attorney that he is able to do this and fend for the for the, the word of Yah in, in such a way. So this is, I don't even know if I say this word right. Hog Samek, the final day of unleavened bread, a remembrance and a rehearsal. And um, obviously the pictures, we have Messiah Yahushua walking on water. And we also have Moshe that is making the land dry. Shalom. Today is day 21 of month one on the Creator's calendar, also known as April 23rd, 2022 on the Roman calendar. I trust you all had a good Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. I hope you distinguish between the Passover and the Feast. These are the two separate and distinct appointed times with different focus and purpose. The Passover is a simple, solemn event that remembers plagues, death and blood it offered protection from judgment while the israelites remained in their homes eating a bland and hurried meal awaiting their deliverance the feast of unleavened bread is generally understood to include the period when yisrael first began leaving egypt day 15 of month one until when they finally got out of egypt day 21 month one it celebrates the deliverance process the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is traditionally associated with the day that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and finally left Egypt. So the seven days commemorates the journey out of Egypt, thus the Unleavened Bread for those for seven days. They were on the move for those seven days and there was no time for their bread to rise. Right now we are in the final day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is a weekly Sabbath and also a high Sabbath. For the last seven days, we have been focusing on keeping leaven out of the homes, out of our homes and lives. As I mentioned last week, this lesson goes far beyond not eating bread and crackers. It is an exercise and a rehearsal intended to purify a bride for the Messiah. As we remember Yisrael passing through the waters, we focus on getting cleaned up so we can walk on the waters with Yahushua. In fact, we want to be in the group that stands on the sea of fire and glass. And I saw something like a, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, having harps of Elohim, Revelation 15.2. And I'm going to break into this real quick because for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, we are here, right? We are to the point where the beast has risen. He's pushing his image on everybody. I don't know if you guys have, have looked at patent 060606, but the beast has come, the beast is gone. It's here among us right now. And so those of us who are left, who are left undefiled by Cobra Commander and his group are these ones, right? And this is the second exodus that I've been talking about for a very long time that I believe there will be a second exodus, and, but it will be for those who are faithful. Right? Completely faithful. And you have to have faith. You're going to have to have faith. The same faith that Peter had when he stepped into that water, but then he lost. So we got to have better faith than that. This celebration has very serious future ramifications for those who get the point of the rehearsal. There is a unique offering made in the midst of the seven-day feast. On day 16 of month one, there is a special resheet. First, offering of barley made by the priest. This year it would have occurred on Monday, April 18th, 2022. That offering initiates the beginning of the grain, harvest leading up to the Feast of Shavuot. While some refer to this resheet barley offering in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread as the Feast of First Fruits, that is not correct. There is no separate and different feast contained within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Anyone teaching such a thing is an error. And that's crazy that he mentions this because I'll, you know, I, don't, I do not watch YouTubers. I do not watch people that are supposedly teaching the Torah because I get extremely disappointed and Honestly, when everybody's out there shilling for cash and out looking for donations, we're not Levites. So the first thing that turns me off on every single person out there shilling for cash is that their hand is out and they want your cash. So, and I saw that. I saw everybody, they were teaching about um, the Feast of First Fruits. And so here we are. 
There is no separate and different feast contained within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Anyone teaching such a thing is an error. The Feast of First Fruits is actually the Feast of Shavuot, when the people would bring the first fruits, Bikurim, of the wheat. In Numbers, we read that Shavuot is called the Day of the First Fruits, Bikurim. Also on the Day of the First Fruits, Bikurim, when you bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah at your Feast of Weeks, you shall have a set-apart convocation. You shall do no customary work, Numbers 28, 26. Since Shavuot is also a feast, you could call it the Feast of the First Fruits. As with everything concerning the appointed times, it is important to make distinctions. While every feast, Hag, is an appointed time, Moad, not every appointed time, Moad, is designated as a feast. There are three appointed times designed as feasts. 1. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. 2. Shavuot. 3. Sukkot. These were times when every male would make a pilgrimage to meet with Yahuwah. He essentially scheduled a gathering at his house. The Feast of Unleavened Bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you in the appointed time of the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before Adon Yahuwah Elohai of Yisrael. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before Yahuwah your Elohim three times in the year. Exodus 34, 18 through 24. These three pilgrims' feasts are the anchor points of the appointed times, and the first two are connected and tied together by a special count. The resheet barley offering made in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts a count that culminates with the day of the first fruits, the Feast of Shavuot. Today is actually day six of the Omer count leading up to Shavuot, which is literally called Weeks, Shavuot. During this period of counting, we count days, weeks, and Sabbaths. Today is also the first Sabbath in the count. We are commanded, commanded to count seven weeks from the morrow after the Sabbath, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, followed by the 50th day, Shavuot. There is a common misunderstanding concerning when to begin the counting of days and weeks. Some have been taught that the count begins after the weekly Sabbath, but that is inconsistent with the historical understanding of Leviticus 23.15. The expression, the morrow after the Sabbath, Leviticus 23.11, has sometimes been misunderstood as implying that the presentation of the so-called first sheaf was to be always made on the day following the weekly Sabbath of the Passover week. This view adopted by the Bothesians and the Sadducees in the time of Christ and by the Karaite Jews and certain modern interpreters rests on a misinterpretation of the word Sabbath. Leviticus 23, 24, 32, and 39. As an anal analogous allusions to other feasts in the same chapter, it means not the weekly Sabbath, but the day of the festival. The testimony of Josias, Antiquity 3, 10, 5, and 6, or Philo, up 2, 294, and of Jewish tradition leaves no room to doubt in this instance we are to understand by the Sabbath, the 15th of Nisan, which is, again, Nisan is not a, a it's not a month, this, this is all thrown in after, on whatever day of the week it might fall, Edershim, Alfred, the temple, its ministry and its services, page 142. Beginning the count after the weekly Sabbath is a Karate, Sadducean, and Bothesian Bo tradition. The weekly Sabbath is separate and apart from the high Sabbaths included in the annual appointed times. The morrow after the Sabbath referred to in Leviticus 23, 11, when the Rishi barley offered, offering is waived, is the morrow after the high Sabbath of day 15. So the count begins on day 16 of month one. We can actually prove that this is how Moshe, Joshua, and Yahushua counted the Omer. I know that this can be confusing for people unfamiliar with the scriptures and supporting evidence. As a result, I have published an article titled, When Do We Celebrate Shavuot? And posted on the website. And that's shamayisrael.net, folks. I hope that you find it helpful. If you need more detail, you can get more in-depth information from the Walk and Light series book entitled Appointed Times. Further, the developers of the Torah Calendar website have created a 2022 Omer Calendar available for downloading and printing. That helps you stay awake and focused on the count. The count is important because it connects the harvest and the first fruits. It ties together the covenant journey from the initial blood covenant and meal at Passover to the preparation process of the redeemed bride to the wedding at Sinai. One of the eye-opening ethnies that I had at the start of my Torah journey was when I realized that Sinai was a wedding ceremony. 
The Torah was given to Yisrael, the bride of Shavuot, Pentecost. By no coincidence, this is the same day that the Spirit fell upon those devout men who were gathered in Jerusalem after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Yahushua. See Acts 2. The Spirit was sent to empower people to follow Him and obey His commandments. That is why the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Revelation 22, 17. Remember that the Torah was not a harsh set of oppressive laws intended to enslave the Israelites. They had just been delivered from slavery by their Redeemer. Rather, the Torah was a ketubah, a wedding agreement between a husband and a bride. It defined the terms of the relationship and the rules of the house. So many Christians believe that they are the bride of Christ, yet they have no clue what Yahushua expects from his bride because they reject the ketubah. That is pre precisely why he will tell many that he does not know them. Many think that they know him, but he does not know them because they are lawless. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Every Christian needs to meditate on the following passage. Now by this we know that we are, know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of Elohim is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. 1 John 2. If we keep the commandments, we know him. If we say we know him, but do not obey him, we are a liar. It's that simple. Yahushua obeyed the Torah and he taught the Torah. We must walk as he walked according to the Torah. There is no new commandment. It was with us from the beginning. The Aleph Ta, the word associated with the Messiah, is in the Hebrew text at the beginning, but completely missing from our English translations. See Genesis 1 1 and Revelation 1 8, 1 11, 21 6, and 22 13 in Hebrew. We are subject to the same commandments, the same Torah given to Adam in the garden, in the beginning. Adam transmitted the instructions orally, which was very common in ancient times. The Torah was later written by Yahuwah and Moshe for the bride, Yisrael. It was also written on the whitewashed stones as doorposts for the land at Mount Ebal. See Deuteronomy 27, 1 through 8. Anyone who wanted to dwell with Yisrael could read the Torah and decide whether they would join the covenant. Right now, his bride should be preparing herself. She should be making herself ready so she is found without spot or wrinkle, without leaven. I was talking to a brother last week about an event that helped me decades ago involving cleansing my home. It happened before I was aware of the application of the Feast of Unleavened Bread to my life. When I was younger, before I got married, I used to travel often to Asia. I smuggled Bibles into Vietnam prior to relations having been normalized with, with the United States, and I had strong friendships with Christians there. Despite those good intentions, I brought home many trinkets and souvenirs that could only be described as idols. What I thought as art, with dragons and the like, was simply demonic portrayals and images. When Yahuwah showed me this truth, I went through my house and purged of everything that opened doors for the enemy to come into my home. It was truly a life-changing exercise as the fog was lifted and my spiritual eyes were opened. I then learned the commandment of the mezuzah, doorpost, that is part of the Shema. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our Elohim. Yahuwah is one. You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts, mezuzah, of your house and on your gates, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. When we write the commands where the blood of the lamb was applied, we are confirming that those in the house are covered by the blood and guided by the ketubah, the Torah. The house and the people are set apart for Elohim. That is how the bride prepares herself for the Messiah. She separates from the world, washes, and makes herself ready. We must be baptized with water and fire so that we can stand on the sea of fire and glass. So keep counting to 50 as we get ready for our wedding and a jubilee celebration. Hag Samak and Shabbat Shalom. Todd, ShemaiYisrael.net. Okay, guys, I strongly encourage that you guys take a look at Todd's site. He always has stuff there. He has a ton of books, but he's one of the very few authors I know that if you want a book and you can't afford a book, just ask him. He will gladly send you a book. He has he has e-books. He has all sorts of stuff. Todd has littered prisons with books. 
And, and the, if you have not read any of his books, a light in the series book, it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And again, if you don't have the cash, you want something like that, simply send him an email. This guy is a brother. He, he's not here to make money for sure. He does not make money on these books. They're simply there because he's had a lifetime of walking the Torah and he has wonderful information. So guys, with that, I hope you guys are good. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and uh, I'm out.